And we're actually going to read the whole rest of the chapter, so try to get through that reading and uh, see what the Word has for us tonight. At the same time, there rose no small stir about that way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know by what that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost all throughout Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificent magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. When they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusions. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, the men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord unto the theater. When Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Not a wise thing for him to go and speak to these people at this time, they said. Verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another. For the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not, wherefore they were come together. That is right off of CNN. Do you see what that says? They cried one thing, and some another. For the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. Have you seen people ask, uh, interviewers ask crowds of rioters, why are you here? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> they don't even know why they assembled. This, again, nothing new under the sun. They dealt with this stuff then. Verse 33, And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting them forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people, but when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not that the city of the Ephesians is the worshiper of the great goddess of Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye do ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. This is now the town clerk, just so you know. This isn't a Christian, this isn't Paul, it's a town clerk. Verse 37. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies, let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause thereby we may give an account of this concourse. When he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll start to unpack this. Father, thank you for this evening and each one of those that are here are watching online. I pray that you bless the uh, proceedings of your word here in Jesus' name. Amen. This is not the first time in the book of Acts that we've seen a run-in with idolatry. But tonight, I want to deal with it a little more extensively. I want to look at the persuasiveness of idols, the simultaneous weakness and power of idols, and then the cost of smashing those idols. Starting with the persuasiveness, or, or pervasiveness, I'm sorry, of idols. Uh, verse 26, This Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Demetrius, the silversmith, the maker of idols, was very unhappy with Paul. He was unhappy with the Christianity that Paul is preaching. It's interesting that he's able to summarize something that Paul teaches. It says in verse 26, this fellow Paul says the gods made by human hands are no gods at all. Evidently, Paul had preached this so often and in so many places that it even almost became a slogan. Even his enemies had heard about it. And if you look at it as an adage... It's pretty good. If you make your own gods, they're not gods. That'd make a good bumper sticker, wouldn't it? Uh, or a t-shirt. If you make your own gods, they're not gods. Did you uh, hear about the company that printed blank bumper stickers? This is for people that didn't want to get involved. But anyway, people had been talking about it. Uh, Paul was preaching. It made it a huge impact. 
And it was actually changing the economy. It was bothering that it was making a difference in the money they could make. Nothing will stir up passions quicker than religion. Nothing. The worst wars in history have been religion wars, religious wars. It is the religion that makes the situations in the Islamic countries, nations today, so relentless and merciless. It's religion that powers all that. I had a conversation last week with a man about religion. And it, it's always, I always get a little bit of inward joy as I talk. He was, a, he was not a believer and he felt that religion was the cause of all the world's problems. And he's talking about religion, you know, I'm a pastor, he knew I was a pastor, and so religion does this, people do all this because of religion, and religion's not a, religion's terrible, causes all kinds of problems. And I said, I agree with you, I hate religion. I always like to do that if they know I'm a pastor because it confuses them. What are you talking about? But I do hate religion. God hates religion. Religion is Satan's answer to Christianity. Sin is, sin is as well, but religion is what uh, Jesus said will cause a, make a person a twofold child of hell. That was religion. That wasn't sin. And so religion makes, uh, is, is something that creates passions in people. And so Paul frequently preached the gospel as opposed to idols. Now, I, I don't know if we'd go this far, but I, I believe we really can't fully grasp the gospel until we see how the gospel is opposed to idolatry. Paul rarely preached the gospel without preaching about idolatry. Look at, look at the book of Acts, and you'll notice that. And we shouldn't either. Now, you could claim that this does not apply today. That was then. This is now. People don't have stone idols in their homes anymore. They don't have statues that they worship. We live in a secularized society. People don't believe in gods, in many gods anymore. In fact, they hardly believe in God at all. So why in the world would we preach about idolatry? Well, when you look at American society today, I like how one writer put it, he calls it expressive individualism. And when it's applied to religion, it means that no one has any right to tell you who God is. No one has a right to tell anyone what to believe. That's kind of a basis of American thinking. You can believe in, worship whoever you want. People have the worst right to worship any God that they like. Yet that's at the very heart of what Paul is saying is wrong here. Idolatry is at the heart of that type of thinking. What is an idol? I, I, automatically, I think our minds go to uh, a stone like the, the god Dagon. Remember the god Dagon when the Ark of the Covenant was brought by it? It fell down. I love that story. That's what we think of when we think of an idol. A big something that you look at and you worship. Well, an idol is, is idolatry is not just that. And idolatry is not really doing bad things. Idolatry is taking good things and turning them into the ultimate thing. That's all idolatry is. Idolatry is taking created things and turning them into absolutes. Romans chapter 1 talks about this. When people have rejected the creator to, work the cre uh, to worship the creation. Idolatry is no more than us saying, if you can have that, if, if I can have this, if I can accomplish this, if I could get to that, then I'd be happy, then I'd be fulfilled. If it's more important than, than God is to you, if you love it more than God, it's an idol. You don't have to have a stone statue for it. That's all idolatry is today. If it's a greater source of happiness, hope, and meaning to you than God is, then that is your God. And understand, we're talking about good things. Idols are not always wicked. Idols can be good things. But they are made into the main thing. We think about people addicted to drugs and alcohol. Now that's a form of idolatry because it's something you're looking to instead of God for your inner contentment, peace, and, and uh, satisfaction. But it's a mistake to think that all idolatry is like that. Because what more people do is they turn good things, or they try to turn the good things into ultimate things. What am I talking about? Well, family. Family is a very powerful idol. You know, family is something that keeps a lot of people from serving God. Uh, it can, your parents' approval, wanting your parents' approval, or, or your children doing well, uh, that can be an idol in your life. A career can be an idol. Is a career a bad thing? No, but it can be an idol. Money can be an idol. Is money a bad thing? No, it is not. 
Money is not evil. The love of money is the root of all evil, but money itself is not evil. Money is a tool. Uh, yet it can be an idol. Achievement and applause can be an idol. Your looks, your moral record, any relationship you're involved in, a political cause, your skill, we could go on and on down the list. These things can become an idol. Why do we, I don't know exactly how many, I know last week we had over 100 people here. Why are there not more people here tonight? I'm not trying to judge anybody, but people are making choices, aren't they? Every day of their life, people make choices. And we had better be careful that we don't let things come between us and God. Now, these are all good things, family, career, uh, uh, moral record, your relationship, all these things we mentioned are good things. We just can't let them become between us and God. So when you read the book of Acts, you see in this society there was a God on every corner. They had a war God, they had a sex God, they had a work God, they had a play God, they had an agricultural God, they had a, a, they had a financial God. There's a God for everything that they had. In fact, last two weeks ago we even talked about the, two, the, 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 the uh, altar they made to the unknown God. They even had that. Every God they could conceive of, and then they made an altar for the unknown God. We look, around, we look at that and we say, wow, they were some superstitious people. But look around today, is our society any different? Just because we don't have altars? Just because we don't have statues? Uh, I, I would contend that they were overt about something that we are covert about as a society. See, we just don't call them gods. We don't bow down and worship to them. We don't build an altar to them. We're a little more overt about it than they were covert about. Uh, we're more covert about what they were overt about. They were conscious about something we're more unconscious of. But any relationship, any activity can be turned into a kind of God. Just because we don't have stone idols or temples built to them is no excuse. We call it, we may not call it by the name of a god, but we see worship of all kinds, uh, just like they had in the book of Acts. So let's not, let's not just throw the idea of idolatry away. Idolatry is a major, major problem in our society today. Secondly, I want you to see idols are a mixture of weakness and emptiness. At the same time, there's power and weakness at the same time. You can see the power. Paul is preaching against idolatry and there's a riot. Just by pushing against idolatry, it brought about a violent response. They burst into a frenzy. They started to chant, great, Diana, great is Diana of the Ephesians. The Bible says here, for two hours, they're chanting this and other things. They burst out on the street, shouting the name of their goddess. Verse 32 that I read is that picture of confusion. The universal chant that they were doing denigrated into nonsense and gibberish. Some would be shouting for Artemis. Some would be shouting anti-Semitic things. Some would be cursing the name of Paul. Some would be shouting down Christianity. <clears throat> now, what we see happening here, if you try to take, some, if you take something from somebody that's a good thing in their life, it might make them upset, it might make them sad. But if you take something from somebody that's their ultimate thing, that they, is their meaning in life, they go ballistic, and that's what you see here. Religion incites passion in people. In that sense, idols have a great deal of power. They control the people who worship them. If you push back on them, like Paul did, they will react sometimes violently. We see then the power of idolatry. There are places in the Bible that talks about idols, and false gods as very powerful. Other times it talks about them as nothing. They really are nothing in and of themselves. But that actually comes out here in this passage here. Notice something interesting here. This incident does not ha end with a speech from Paul. It ends with a speech by the city clerk. This is kind of unique in the book of Acts too. And we shouldn't jump over what he said. And I want to kind of boil down what he said here. I won't read the whole thing, but he's essentially saying, you say these guys are disrupting the social order, you are the ones disrupting the social order. And he talks about in the last part of the chapter, there, the Romans could come down on us. We could bring down the law. They could declare martial law. This is a riot. You don't have any reason for it. They claimed idols were the basis of their social order. But this day, idols and idolatry was disrupting the social order. This is what you see 
all throughout the Bible. Idols never give you what they promise. Idols never deliver. You know, we put all our faith in money. You get a bunch of money and you find out it doesn't give you happiness. It doesn't give you fulfillment. Fame and success, you find out it doesn't do it for you either. I have all kinds of quotes. I pull them out sometimes, use them in different messages. I have a whole list of quotes by uh, rich, famous, powerful, wealthy people who talk about the absolute futility of their pursuits. It doesn't give, do it for them. Idolatry never gives what it promises. It won't give you happiness. It won't give you love. It won't give you fulfillment. It actually always ends up giving you the opposite of that. Anything that you make more important than God in your life, which is an idol, will do that to you. It will fail you every single time. Now that's why Paul talks about idolatry when he's preaching the gospel. Because we have to come face to face with that. The gospel is that Jesus died for your sins, and through him you can have a right relationship with God, but until you contrast that with idolatry, you, you don't really see the full implications of the gospel. That's why Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't have two gods in your life. You have to make that choice. And the gospel is that you're justified, not by anything you do, but what, what Christ has done, and we have to put our full trust and faith in him. But everyone, whether they're religious or secular, that rejects that is trying to be justified by something that they're doing. The idea that being moral or religious, and, and if I live that way, then God will bless me, will answer my prayers, that's nothing less than Phariseeism. That's the word, Phariseeism. But that's what uh, the appeal was and what Paul had to say. That's why so many people responded. I think it's the same is true even today. Many people accept the gospel after a life of morality and religion has not gotten them anywhere. I, I don't know if you've had the, a chance yet. I highly encourage it to see the movie my brother did about uh, the, our, our life, those that left the Amish. It's tremendous. He did a great job. There's a testimony by all of our, most of, most of them our parents. And uh, this is exactly what you see here. After a life of deep, deep religion, freedom of the gospel broke through and that they responded with much joy. So idols are very powerful in that way. They have a grip on people. At the same time, they're empty. They never give what they promise. So idols are weak and powerful at the same time. Number three, the only way to destroy idols is to do so at a cost. The cost of smashing these idols. There's no way to destroy idols with what without a cost. What's so intriguing here is that Paul was... He was almost killed because he opposed idols. In verse 30, it says he wanted to go before the crowd, but they wouldn't let him. He would have probably been torn to pieces. This was the rage that idolatry produced. There's no way to destroy idols without a cost. That's why the Bible tells us in Exodus 20, verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Idols are not just psychological forces. There are spiritual forces behind them. Satan would love to get things between us and God. He constantly tries to put idols in our way. The Bible talks about idols and demons and principalities and powers. It's very difficult to fight them. Now, I know this because I often identify in just dealing with people and counseling an idol in a person's life. Sometimes they're very evident. And there are people either come through here for counseling or maybe come to church for a while or something. They have an idol. They consistently put it before or between them and God. They give God the leftovers. It's very evident with the choices that they make. And everything is fine if we talk about anything but that idol. But you let me approach that. Am I speaking anything you're familiar with, Pastor Forsberg? <laughs> when you approach that, it can get vicious. People don't like to face up to their idols. Look, I don't like to face up to my idols. All right? We're all in the same boat. It's a, it, they create a passion. So we're talking about these people. We see how they responded. How do we respond? When we come to face to face with our idols. Nothing, and I mean nothing, brings out the venom in someone like exposing their idol. That's what happened to Paul here. And Psalm 16, 4. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. 
but you point it out, and you might have a war on your hands. It's a serious problem that as a pastor, I don't always have the answer on how to deal with it. Uh, so you uh, can continue to pray for me on that. But uh, here in Acts, we have a situation where Paul is almost killed by a crowd who's furious because their idol was exposed. Now, at the end of the book of Luke, another person was killed by a crowd that yelled, crucify him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, and having spoiled, talking about Jesus, having spoiled principalities and powers, I'll take a pizza, two toppings, he made a show of them, oh, this is what the Bible says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, how did Jesus do it? He paid the cost for our, for our idolatry on the cross. Praise God. Now, there's times in the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament, you'll see where God equates Israel's foray into idolatry as adultery. Uh, you're playing the adulteress when you put yourself in the arms of other gods. You're being unfaithful to me. That's God's message to Israel. Idolatry is seen in the Old Testament under the metaphor of spiritual adultery. Remember, James does the same. He adulterers and adulteresses when he talks about this. In Jeremiah 3.20, he says, Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. You read Jeremiah 3, and it talks about this in detail. God says in verse 8, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committeth adultery, I had her put away, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Then in verse 14, it's a great chapter, by the way, I encourage you to read it. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you, one of a city, and two of a family, and will bring you to Zion. Now, if you look at this, reading some commentaries, some scholars struggle with the idea that God is talking to Israel and says, because of your adultery, I'm going to divorce you, but then he says, I'm going to bring you back. They say this doesn't make any sense. It's not consistent because, as you know, in the Old Testament, the penalty for adultery was death, not divorce. Uh, so God, is God actually violating his own law here, his own rules? In the human world, if a man or a woman committed adultery, the penalty was death. Yet here's God, he's saying, you've committed adultery, I'm going to divorce you and then bring you back. But if you're a Christian, reading from the viewpoint of the New Testament, you look at it differently. Jesus Christ, our true husband, came to earth, went to the cross, died in our place. He bore the cost of our idolatry. He paid the penalty, took our punishment, so he can be both, he can judge evil and yet at the same time open his arms for us. He can end evil without ending us. Isn't that a blessing? He paid the price because we're forgiven. He did that. He bore the cost. Now that's something we can rejoice in, but I don't want to overlook the application. There are many levels to idolatry. But let's apply it and bring it home right to where we are. What are we going to do about it? Every single one of us, uh, we struggle with this to a certain level. I think we will until we go to heaven. We have the potential of having idols in our life, things that you put between you and God. Remember when we discussed the Stoics in verse 17, or chapter 17, I'm sorry? They uh, claim that if you, did, if you attach your heart to anything, it creates an enslavement. That's what the Stoics believe. So they, their mantra was detach from everything. You be apathetic towards everything in life. That's not the answer. You don't need to love things less. You don't need to love your family less. You don't need to love your career less. You just need to love God more. That's not, not something that we can just make that statement and it magically happens. We can't just decide to love God more. That's more intellectual than a heart thing. But I believe if we... Focus on what Paul focused on, the gospel, that's Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Get a good look of Christ on the cross. You need to see Jesus lying in a tomb for you. You need to see him dying for you. And we need to sense that, rejoice in that, until your heart increases in love because of his sacrifice. That's one reason why we do communion. 
Uh, it says it right in the front of the table there. Just do in remembrance of me. We remember. We remind ourselves the cost that Jesus Christ paid. And when we see the sacrifice that he made on our behalf, when we really get, I mean, we really know it and we really understand it, then money just becomes money. People just become people. We don't love them less. We uh, still love people. We love our families. But we recognize they're just people. They're not saviors. My wife, I love my wife to death, but she's not my savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is my savior. So you, that's what's going to set us free from idolatry. And so Paul, when he's dealing with these folks, he deals with idolatry. And how does he do it? He deals with it with the gospel. And if we get a good understanding of the gospel, it'll help us to deal with this area of idolatry. It would be a good practice for every one of us to just identify our idol or what is tempted to be our idol. I mean, if, it would be simple. If, if you watch eight hours of television a day and read your Bible five minutes, you know I'm saying? I mean, we can get right down to brass tacks. If you, uh, you know, you... you uh, Go to church once a month, but do other things and, and uh, never miss other things. You know what I'm saying? We can go down the route of a practical application, but we're smart people. We can do that ourselves. What is it that is tempting to be our idol? It could be anger. It could be bitterness. It could be hatred. It could be a whole bunch of things. Don't let it be your idol. So when you recognize that, then we ask the question, what do we do about it at that point? We go back to what I said in the beginning. We're going to have a revival, and we're going to have a riot. <laughs> it's uh, Paul had a riot on his hand. I want to have a revival in my heart. I want to identify those idols and get them out of my life. Amen? Let's put that in practice. Father, thank you for this passage, this text. I pray, Lord, that you...